Good. Well, it's a privilege today to have Cohen with us. Um, as I said to you earlier, this is the first time that Cohen has preached. And so we're going to start with a word of prayer. And what we're going to ask for you to do is for all of you, in just 30 seconds of quiet, to pray for Cohen and pray for us as that we may listen to what God has given him to share with us. So you pray silently for 30 seconds and then I'm going to pray for Cohen and then we're going to come and listen to God's word as it's been shared with Cohen. Father, in this uh, moment of quiet, we experience um, your pleasure. We feel your joy in the work that you've done in Cohen's life. As you worked um, those years ago to bring about your purposes of good, to redeem him from bondage and from other things, we thank you, Father, that as you stand today with him, sharing with him from your word, um, that you feel joy in that as you look at this son that you've taken and redeemed and are equipping for purposes of good and blessing for many others. We thank you for the work he's invested in preparing this today and we thank you that it's no accident that all these things have come together for good and so we look forward to, Father, hearing from him and hearing from you um, as you have shared with him in his preparation time. So we ask your blessing upon him and upon us as we share this time together now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Cohen, it's your turn. Hello? Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah. Great. <clears throat> so, um, not too sure the passage isn't up there, but it'll be f rereading from Mark 5, verses 1 to 20. Um, and while you're turning, I'll just start with a brief introduction of myself. So, my name is Cohen, again, for those of you I haven't met uh, officially. Uh, it's really nice to be here and to see you all. Uh, to be able to share the word with you. And I just thank you for the opportunity. It really is a blessing. Um, yeah, I've been working on this for about a month, I guess, and uh, the, the anticipation has been tangible. Uh, <laughs> so it's really good to be here and to be able to speak and kind of let it out in a sense. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I am a bit nervous uh, just with um, you know, reading the Word of God. Uh, you know... Before I uh, before I come to Glow, I was a uh, worked on a farm, and uh, I'd ha we I'd handle a lot of very dangerous chemicals, so chemicals that would, you know, scald and burn your skin and <coughs> skin and uh, chemicals that if you ingested even a teaspoon, it would uh, it would end your life. Uh, but uh, I get no got nowhere near as nervous doing that as handling God's word. <laughs> um, <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> Uh, Paul said to Timothy, let no one despise your youth, but be an example in conduct and in the word. So I hope that I can do that today. Um, so yeah, i got a bit to say, and I like to talk when I get the chance. So um, I was going to start with a word of prayer, but uh, I just thank you all for your prayers. I appreciate that. So I think we'll just get straight into the passage. Uh, again, Mark 5, verses 1 to 20. Uh, and I'll, I'll be reading from the, the New King James Version. But yeah. oh, Thank you so much. Okay, ver Mark, Mark 5, verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. He said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered him, 
My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us the swine, that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There are about two thousand. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion, sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marvel. Now, I'm going to start briefly just by <clears throat> identifying what the passage is about. Um, and so I think it's a, primarily about uh, a man possessed and the account of uh, his exorcism by the hand of Jesus. <clears throat> I say that because Mark makes mention of the man 22 times by my count. Uh, he, and later Jesus, also mentions uh, first that this man has an unclean spirit. Uh, and three times Mark describes the man as demon-possessed. He also records this demon as describing itself as a legion. Uh, because of the multitude that is possessing the man. So I'd like to make a brief side point here. Uh, I think it's worth note, just for anyone who's a note taker. Uh, Mark, I think, is he's not mincing words here. <clears throat> he's clearly stating that a supernatural entity, um, demonic in nature, is pres presently possessing the man. So the man is not a lunatic. The man is not afflicted with a mental illness and the man is not suffering from <coughs> a mental disorder. He's under the influence uh, of a demon. So the reason I bring this up is because I really think it's vital that we understand the enemy that we're facing here. People can be quick to write off sinful habits as some um, mental disorder that can be fixed by medicine or counselling. Um, and now I'm not saying that we shouldn't do these things. Uh, they are helpful when used appropriately. Um, but my own testimony is that of a lifelong battle with demonic forces. Uh, and I can tell you from my experience, uh, the devil is real and so are his demons. Uh, I don't think it's something to take lightly at all. Um, I grew up in a family that worshipped demons by practicing a cult. Um, and as did I. Uh, so I was tormented and lived in close contact with demons, uh, demonic forces from a, a young age. Um, and that went right up until I was uh, gifted the Holy Spirit at my conversion almost five years ago. Uh, so I'll put that aside for now and I'll tell you a little more of my testimony just in a short moment. Um, but ba just back to the passage. Uh, now that we know what Mark is primarily talking about here um, and a bit about this man, uh, you might now be thinking, well, uh, what's this got to do with me? <clears throat> I haven't seen anyone like that and certainly have not experienced it personally. Well, before I attempt to try and answer that for you, uh, I would like to share a little bit of my own story uh, again and how I've answered that for myself. Uh, this man that Mark is writing about uh, actually reminds me a bit of my own testimony. Um, so I was quite excited to see that this was the passage I was given the opportunity and privilege to preach on as my first sermon. Uh, I watched a couple of sermons by Tim Keller in preparation for this. Uh, very helpful. But I was slightly intimidated also. Uh, <laughs> I thought to myself sarcastically, I may as well just point you to his sermons or let him do the talking. Uh, you'll be happy to know I didn't entertain the thought. <laughs> 
Uh, so rather I took what he said and I used it to help me understand my own circumstances and experiences. And in doing so, by extension, hopefully helping everyone else here listening. Please tell me how I go at the end, if you uh, so choose. Uh, but just so you know, I have included some quotes of his uh, as reference, because I'll be using a bit of what he said. So now back to the passage. Uh, before this man was demon-possessed, uh, he and met Jesus Christ. Sorry. Before this demon-possessed man met Jesus Christ, uh, he did some things. So he lived in the tombs. No one could bind him. Uh, he had been bound with chains, uh, but pulled them apart. He could not be tamed, and night and day he was in the mountains, uh, cutting himself. Well, I thought that was me a bit before I met the Lord Jesus. I was strong-willed, lived alone or as a kind of lone wolf, uh, couldn't be bound or tamed, and I would cry sometimes at night as I hurt myself. After I became a follower of Christ, uh, like I said, almost five years ago, uh, I soon began reflecting on my past and meditating on the ways in which I used to think and do things uh, in order to try and understand who I am and where I come from. Um, but eventually, I eventually began to use a depiction of myself as that of a, a wild cult. Uh, and I use that picture because of my background working uh, on remote cattle stations in Queensland. Um, like a cult, I was proud of my strength. I did as the Israelites did when they had no king, as I saw fit. Uh, no one could put a bit in my mouth, as you would a horse, or shackles on my wrist to control me. And anyone that tried to tame or bound me, uh, I would throw off. I worked hard and it was my strong will that brought me much praise and uh, great success in the agricultural industry. Uh, but at night, when my strength waned, I would return to the solitude of my bedroom um, and I'd cry sometimes from exhaustion or loneliness. I longed for the soft and gentle touch of a woman and so I became enslaved by pornography and sexual promiscuity. And to cope with the pain of exhaustion, I became an alcoholic and was addicted to booze. You see, I didn't fully realize it at the time, but I'd made a deal with the devil. Just like the demon-possessed man in our passage, Satan gave me great power, but with it, great pain and heartache. Tim Keller has said, that's how evil always operates. Satan gives with one hand and takes twice as much with the other. In telling you this, uh, what I'm trying to allude to uh, is that I don't think this demon-possessed man is so different from you and I. Um, the physical symptoms of this man's condition may be strange and extreme, but I think the condition is something all too familiar and something that I think even we can all relate to in some way. Um, and now you might be thinking, well, I've never lived a life like you had, Cohen. That sounds a bit crazy. Uh, some of you might have grown up in Christian homes with Christian families and never had to experience any of this. And, uh, which is great, and I mean that in the most genuine and non-condescending way. Um, but so just let me bring it down another level. Those are the things I live for, uh, but think for a moment now about your own circumstances and ask yourself, what do I live for? And what does my heart really want? Uh, what gives my life meaning? Or who is the Lord of my life? And the main point that I want to make is this. Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Joshua 24.15 Because you only have two options. You're a servant of Jesus Christ or a slave to the devil. Uh, let me put it this way. We are not in control of ourselves, despite what the Stoics might say. Uh, whatever you seek most in your life becomes your Lord. Tim Keller has said, Everybody has something they're chasing. The thing that people say, if I can just get this, then I've got it. If that thing isn't Jesus Christ, you have the making deals with the devil. If you don't love Jesus Christ as your highest possession, the devil has you in his grasp. To illustrate this point further, 
I would like to refer to the account of another exorcism by Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Luke 11, verses 14 to 20. Jesus cast a demon out of a mute, and after being accused by the Pharisees again, Jesus, in the following verse, uh, proceeds to give a parable about a strong man and his palace filled with spoils. I'll assume you have some understanding of the passage because I won't have the time to read it out. Um, but we understand from this passage that the strong man of the, is uh, Satan and that the one stronger than he is Jesus. As we understand, Satan is the god of this age and has significant power to influence our hearts or, in the case of this passage, directly possess someone with a demon, as well as direct people into doing evil. Uh, this parable only accounts for Satan's palace and his spoils and Jesus' power and authority to take those spoils for himself. We see here by Jesus' words specifically in verse 23 that there is no neutrality on the field of battle for men's souls. The one who is freed from Satan's palace but then scatters is therefore not gathered with Christ and in danger of being harmfully influenced or worse, uh, finally overcome by Satan's power. Now by this, my intention and hope is that we all get the idea that we are not truly free, uh, that is, apart from Christ, or in control, and that we are never actually independent from spiritual influence. So now that we understand this, uh, I'd like to get back to our passage, verse 5. Uh, Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was crying and cutting himself with stones. As someone who's battled and continues to contend with depression, my conviction is that deep down in our hearts, we all want one thing, lasting and fulfilling happiness. And Satan, through his influence of this world, will continually attempt to convince us that that happiness that he offers is better than what God can offer. Well, when we believe that lie, the result is people uh, like me and people like the demon-possessed man of this passage, living alone in the mountains and crying and cutting ourselves. So for the main part of this sermon, I'll be preaching from this verse alone because I want you all to walk away from here saying, I choose Jesus. In fact, I should also say, I want nothing to do whatsoever with anything that Satan is offering. And the way I intend to do that is to show you the kind of happiness that Satan offers and explain to you in three, days, three ways why that is broken. But also, more importantly, show you how Jesus is better. So, Tim Keller has said, if you have just got to get this thing or do this and that, there's going to be a pressure to achieve it, an anxiety present. And until you get it, there can be no happiness. This story of the demon-possessed man, I think, is an example of that. He hates himself because all that power uh, is not sufficient. It has not brought him the happiness that was promised by Satan. Only an anxious expectation of how he's going to find and obtain the next new thing in a futile attempt to finally achieve fulfilment. Which brings me to my first point. Satan can only offer you a diminishing happiness. We all know this by godly common sense. The temporal pleasures of this world are under the law of diminishing return and can never fully satisfy. We know that fundamentally as human beings, the things of the past that once elated us will in time no longer be sufficient to satisfy us. Our souls are crying out for more. We are all longing for God, longing for the fulfillment, satisfaction, and joy that comes with knowing him. There have been men in the past who have said, we have a God-shaped hole in our hearts. And if we do not fill that with Christ, we will fill it with one of the devil's many idols. The prophet Isaiah put it this way, why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what is not, on what does not satisfy? And the prophet Jeremiah like this, they have hewn for themselves broken cisterns Cisterns that can hold no water. The Christian author Tim Chester, in his book, You Can Change, wrote this. 
We grow easily bored with life. We are weary with sin-induced futility. We look for joy in sin and we are quickly bored and always moving on in search for more. We grow weary in our futile pursuit of ever greater excitement. Finally, if you thought it was only Christians who had this figured out, uh, if you don't mind, the 19th century German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer uh, put it like this, and I quote, It is difficult, if not impossible, to define the limits which reason should impose on the desire for wealth. For there is no absolute or definite amount of wealth that will satisfy a man. This is why seeking happiness apart from Christ is a diminishing happiness. Only Christ promises to give true and lasting satisfaction. Jesus says, whoever drinks the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life. We can ask Jesus like the Samaritan woman at the well, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Now, Tim Keller has also said, living for anything other than Christ is also a functional happiness. You have to work to get it. But that thing you think will make you happy uh, always takes more, and the give really isn't all that great anyway. Point two, Satan can only offer a functional happiness. One example of a Bible character who understood this was the Apostle Paul. Throughout his epistles, he regards himself as formerly being well advanced in the legalistic law keeping of Judaism, beyond many of his contemporaries in his nation, and being more exceedingly zealous for the tradition of his fathers. He also describes himself in the, his epistle to the Philippians as being a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, uh, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Paul states that if anyone thinks they have confidence in the flesh, he can assure them he had more. It's like Solomon and his vast riches, Paul reached the pinnacle of his misguided workspace religion uh, and found it utterly lacking. I say this, and we know this, because after building up such a compelling list of momentous achievements, he says immediately afterwards, in verses 7 to 8, he counts it all as loss and rubbish compared to the knowledge of Christ. This is what the path of functional happiness looks like. So long as we have people like Paul who have explored the depths of functional happiness, we can know that no one has a chance of fulfilling any kind of fulfillment in works. Only in Christ are we freed from the law and given renewed minds so that we may joyfully serve him by grace in the new way of the Spirit. Now, when it comes to the desire to accumulate temporal earthly gain, the more you have and the more power you get, the less joy that inevitably comes with it. The stakes for achieving success will get increasingly higher, and with it, the chances for failure will increase, with the cost of failure growing greatly in consequence. My third point is this, Satan can only offer an enslaving happiness. Every gain will enslave you to the fear of losing it. This is illustrated well in the legend of the sword of Damocles. As the legend goes, a man named Damocles was in the court of the Greek tyrant Dionysius, lavishing him with praise and flattery about his great riches and prominent status, of which the tyrant responded by inviting him to sit in his place at the royal banquet where a sword hang by the ceiling, suspended by a single thread of horsehair. The sword is meant to represent the imminent and impending peril of being overtaken by one's enemies. It is meant to invoke a sense of what it's like to be a rich and powerful king, though having much fortune, always having to be watchful, for fear and anxiety of those who would seek to destroy him and take all his great wealth. Damocles soon begged the tyrant king to let him depart from his place, realising that the vast riches around him 
was not worth what hung above his head. Dionysus is recorded as having committed many cruelties in his rise to power, of the like that he would never be able to rule justly, because that would make him too vulnerable to his enemies. I hope you can excuse the legend and see the moral of the story. Uh, you may be, not be the courtier of a rich and powerful king, uh, but think again, if you can, about your own circumstances. What I mean is, when at work have you ever told little lies to save face or flatter your boss? And I'm speaking from my own experience. It starts small and seemingly innocent, but before you know it, you're making moral compromises, exploiting and manipulating others for your own gain, and throwing your colleagues under the bus. That is why seeking happiness apart from Christ is an enslaving happiness. It makes you a slave to fear. In Christ we can learn godly contentment. We can trust in our good Father's provision for us and our faith that in no matter the circumstance, God is always working it for our good. We can learn to say like the, with the Apostle Paul, For I have learnt in whatever state that I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learnt both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In conclusion, you might now be thinking, and I speak for myself also, well, these are cases of extremes and I haven't gone that far yet. Just a simple worldly desire here and there. What's the harm in that? Not asking much. But notice verses 3 and 4 of our text in Mark 5. The ESV reads, No one could bind him any more, for he had often been bound. You see, this process was slow and gradual, and this man was once like you and I. You wonder how it could have got so far? Well, it's because the devil doesn't show you the cost of the whole deal at once. Uh, he pulls you away by distracting you with one little desire at a time. So, as disciples of Jesus Christ, what can we do about this? Well, the Apostle Paul said in his, uh, in his epistle to the Galatians, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And in his first epistle to the Corinthians, he says, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So as we live for Christ with renewed minds and in the way of the Spirit, we should seek to purge ourselves of all old leaven, which is sin, and not leave any temptation or opportunities for it to spread throughout our members and have undue control over our thoughts and actions. Instead, we should present our members as instruments for righteousness by doing as Paul says, and meditating on whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report, virtuous, and praiseworthy. Lastly, but most importantly, what has Jesus done for us? The answer to that lies in the rest of the passage. Quite simply, Jesus has done for us in a similar manner uh, the same he did for the demon-possessed man. He has exorcised Satan's power over us, clothed us, and put us in our right mind. Because of Jesus, all who have confessed his name as the Lord and have accepted the work that he has done on our behalf have been and dwelt with the Holy Spirit. Bear with me and let us go back to Luke 11, verse 24, just for a moment. You don't have to turn there, but I will read from that. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He says... I'll return to my house from which I came. When that unclean spirit comes back to those who've had their minds set right by, and are submitted to the authority of the king, uh, the Holy Spirit inside us says, Be gone, unclean spirit. You're no longer welcome here. 
This is my dwelling place now. For what communion has light with darkness? Please take notice of the little details that Mark has included in his account of the gospel. Note the posture of this demoniac. When he saw Jesus, he saw him from afar. And he wasn't indifferent, nor did he run or try and hide. Uh, Why? Because even the demons recognize authority when they see it. This man didn't just walk casually over to Jesus. He ran from afar. And when he reached Jesus, what did he do? He didn't try and fight or argue. No, he worshipped him. And then proceeded to beg Jesus, not once, but three times in the course of this passage. See also the language Mark uses. He describes this demon as a legion. Uh, In a Roman army, a legion was comprised of about 6,000 fighting men. And Jesus doesn't even break a sweat. He doesn't roll up his sleeves or get down on his knees and pray to the Father for strength. Uh, He simply says seven words. Come out of the man, unclean spirit. I'm drawing near the end now, and I know that I haven't covered quite the whole passage, and though I would like to and would keep going, uh, I'll finish with this. Sticking with the theme of threes, we can learn three things about Jesus from this encounter. One, the Lord is gracious. You need not tremble with fear. Verse 7, For what was the demon-possessed man begging Jesus for? That he would not torment him. Even when encountered by a legion of demons, Jesus shows compassion. Think about it. Jesus had the enemy groveling at his feet with the metaphorical axe to his head. And instead of striking, he relents. And he asks for the demon's name and then proceeds to grant their request. I mean, who does that? Uh, Only a merciful God. Jesus assured the man that he had nothing to fear from him. Satan is fine with showing you the holiness and justice of God, but attempts in every way to hide the compassion and mercy of God. Point two. The Lord is merciful. He goes into a world full of evil and he seeks out those who need healing. And he doesn't go out with a sword to conquer and destroy the heathens and their gods. Jesus could have and had every right to turn this man and the demons within him to dust. But John 12 verses 47 to 48 reads, If anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The words which I have spoken will judge him on the last day. And Luke 19, 9. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Jesus died on a Roman cross to make atonement and reconcile us to God. Lastly, the Lord is loving. Your soul is worth more than all the possessions of this world. The pigs are worth a lot of money, uh, but Jesus was happy to send a whole herd running down a cliff to save one man's life. Whether you're a born-again child of God or not, you are exceedingly valuable to him as his creation. And Jesus will go to the deepest, darkest depths of this world to bring you back to him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that you bless the reading of this word. I pray, Lord, that you work in the hearts of everyone here today. Um, Lord, and it's not through my words that bring any change or conviction, but it's through the Holy Spirit. And so that's all I seek to do speaking here today. I pray, Lord, that you work the Holy Spirit in each one of our lives 
in a way that touches our heart and brings us to the cross uh, and to change. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.